Um, good afternoon. Welcome to the Girl Scouts of the USA parallel event, The Right to Lead, a conversation on girls' leadership and political participation. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your afternoon with us as we discuss girls as leaders and political activists. My name is Catherine and I have been a Girl Scout for over 13 years now and Ansel and I are going to be co-moderating today's session. Uh, so we are so excited to have you all with us this afternoon um, as we share our experiences and uh, with political participation as young girls. So we have a great discussion prepared for you, and now I'm going to pass it over to, to um, Adua Adu, who's the Senior Director of Global Girl Scouting at Girl Scouts of the USA, to kick us off. Thanks, Catherine. Welcome, everyone. I just want to take a few moments and let you know a little bit about our organization. So Girl Scouts of the USA is the largest girl serving organization in the United States with the goal of building girls of courage, confidence and character who make the world a better place. We have a next slide, please. We have 1.7 million girl members in the US and 750,000 volunteers and 111 um, councils around the US and in 90 countries around the world through our USA Girl Scouts Overseas Program that serves daughters of military, foreign service, and expats. And we are fortunate enough to be members of the World Association of Girl Guides and Girl Scouts, placing us in a global sisterhood of 10 million in 150 countries around the world. Girl Scouts is all about preparing girls for a lifetime of leadership. The Girl Scout leadership experience is the heart and soul of a girl's experience. Whether a girl is interested in starting her own business, coding the next social network, or changing public policy through the Girl Scout leadership experience's core program pillars, STEM, outdoors, life skills, and entrepreneurship, girls of all interests can discover their skills and talents and passions, connect with people of all backgrounds and experiences, and take action to create the change they want to see in their world. Our proven leadership model helps girls to develop both hard and soft skills, pairing girls with strong, caring female role models and mentors with social capital who prepare them to take the lead from age five to 18 and into adulthood. We're so glad to be having you all here today to sharing a little bit of our work with you. And now I'm going to pass it over to Catherine and Antolin to start our conversation. Thank you, Audra, for that very informative introduction to Girl Scouting. Um, so now I'm going to introduce Kimberly Belmont, who is the Vice President of the Girl Scout Research Institute. In this role, she drives the vision, strategy, and research agenda for GSUSA's applied research arm. The GSRI conducts original studies on girls' leadership and healthy development and assesses program effectiveness and girl outcomes. Kimberly is a social psychologist with a focus on child and adolescent well-being with a specific focus on gender. Prior to joining GSUSA, Kimberly taught classes in research methods, gender studies, and child development through the City University of New York system. She's published in various academic volumes and peer-reviewed journals in the field of social psychology, gender and sexuality studies, archives, social justice theory, and research methods, including the Sage Encyclopedia of Psychology and Gender, the Journal of Research on Adolescence, and Qualitative Psychology. Kimberly is also a proud Girl Scout alum and earned her silver award. And now I'm going to pass it over to Kimberly to share some findings from the 2020 Girl Scouts Research Institute report. Thank you so much, Catherine Antolin, for that warm introduction. So what I want to talk a little bit about today is a recent Girl Scout Research Institute study called A New Decade of Girls Leadership. Uh, so back in, uh, in, in May of 2020, we surveyed 3,000 girls and 1,000 boys ages 8 to 21 um, from across the United States of America, um, really matched to the United States demographics on things like race and ethnicity, um, on geography, uh, and also family income. And the goals of this research were really to revisit an older study that we did in 2008 called Change It Up, what girls say about redefining leadership, and to really understand the landscape today around how young people are experiencing and thinking about leadership. We're publishing the results in two parts, and the first is already available. And later in this presentation, I'll, I'll show you where you can access it. But the first part was really about uh, examining girls' thoughts and beliefs about gender politics and civic engagement. Um, the next 
uh, part of this, this research digs in even deeper into how youth define uh, experience and aspire towards leadership in their current and future lives. So if we go to the next slide, I wanna talk a little bit more about the, the first part of this research, which really applies to everything we're gonna be talking about today. Um, so we were wanting to answer questions like, uh, what are young people's beliefs about gender and political leadership? Or what do girls think about the gender gap in political representation? And what do they think we should do to address it? So we wanted to understand where and how girls are engaging civically and politically um, and how they wanna take the lead. What are their aspirations or career interests and how does that relate to political engagement or civic engagement? So if you go to the next slide, I'll share a little bit about what we found in this study. And one of our first findings really answers the question, uh, how do young people in the USA, um, what do young people in the USA believe about gender and political leadership? And so what we found with this research is that more than seven in 10 girls and boys have really egalitarian views of gender and political leadership. So what you can see in the chart here is a question about, in your opinion, we asked those who took our survey, who makes for better political leaders? And what we find is that most girls and most boys are when reflecting on their own views saying, you know, I think men and women, women and men are doing, you know, they make equally good leaders. Um, we do see some gender differences uh, when we look at those who have a preference for either women or men as leaders. We see that girls are pretty split in their preference for either women or men, um, and that boys tend to prefer men over women when they don't hold these egalitarian views of gender. And one of the quotes from our studies that you that from our study that you see here explains why some of our survey completers really felt that way. So um, one young woman saying, you know, women deserve an equal opportunity in government positions because political decisions affect everyone, regardless of gender. We also see in this, in this research that um, this is actually an increase. The percentage of girls who think that uh, men make better political leaders has decreased from when we did this study the first time in 2008 to 13%. So we're seeing an increased confidence in, in girls' beliefs and attitudes when it comes to their understanding about women's power to take the lead. Uh, we also asked some questions in this particular study about perceptions of um, perceptions of the current Congress, perceptions of the current U.S. state of government, and we found that about three in four girls or young women accurately judge that the current Congress is comprised of more men than women, um, but they did misjudge the size of that gap. So uh, they said that about they guessed that about one in three Congress people were women, when in reality it was closer to one in four. Um, and what we also found, though, is that, you know, where do we go from there with, you know, there is this sort of knowledge or understanding of the current state of government, but we also found that 86% um, of girls or young women who believe that there is a gap would want to increase the number of women elected, and that that general finding was also true of boys in the study. Yeah. Um, if we go to the next slide, please, please perfect. Um, we asked our survey participants, you know, how can we address the gender gap in politics? What are the steps we need to, to take? What are the actions we should take in this space? And girls are pretty clear about what they want us to do. So first, they say that we just need to encourage girls to think of themselves as leaders. But what's really key here is that this includes addressing stereotypes around who it is that can be a leader. They talked about the need to teach all children, including boys, so all children regardless of gender, about the importance of, of gender equality and particularly gender equality in politics uh, and ensure that there is access to civic education in or outside of schools to really increase girls' interest and knowledge in the subject. And what, what we find is that, you know, past research shows that in the U.S. only about one in four eighth grade students are sufficiently knowledgeable in civics. But what we're hearing in this research is that to close the gender gap, children and teens of all genders need civics education that's not just teaching about how government works, it's also helping them see the important roles that they can play um, now and in the future. And so this means that education has to break down stereotypes about women and girls in leadership and really teach the importance of gender inclusion um, in government and in civics. And what you see here in this one quote on the slide is that kids in school should learn about influential women. We hardly ever learn about women in power and that may lead us to assume that women cannot be politically powerful. And so really calling for representation and calling for specific attention uh, on, on, on teaching, the way we're teaching about civics and the way we're teaching about women's leadership. If you go to the next slide, there are a few other 
uh, tips or suggestions that girls were very clear on. So one is that making sure girls have uh, access or have opportunities to practice leadership. So this could be through an out-of-school time organization, um, and you'll he hear more from that when we get to our next panel. Um, and the second is connecting girls to role models who can encourage them to take the lead. And we see some examples of, of how uh, young people are really expressing this in the quotes on this, on this slide. So encouraging girls to take an interest in politics and not be afraid that they don't belong there. So again, we're getting at that representation piece and girls should be encouraged more in school to take on leadership roles. Um, so again, asking for some of those practical hands-on ways to practice leadership. Um, if you go to the next slide, we did, we did also learn about all of the ways that girls are sort of finding, finding opportunities to engage civically and to take action. Um, I'm not showing it in this deck, but what we did learn from those who are old enough to vote in the US, that many of them were using uh, their ability or to vote as a way to engage civically. But girls of all ages, regardless of whether or not they're voting in the United States, uh, are finding ways to really take action. So we found that more than two thirds, 68%, have engaged in civic or political activities. And this means they're getting involved in causes that they care about, supporting their local communities through volunteer work, or even reaching out to engage their elected officials. Um, we did find that this engagement increases with age, as you can see here on the chart, that teenagers and young adults were a little more likely to engage civically compared to our younger girls. Uh, but we found also that, um, so aside from these specific ways of engaging civically, we did ask about, you know, where does this fit in your school life? And we found that girls do have some experience with school-based or extracurricular leadership activities with seven in 10 holding leadership roles in after-school clubs or organizations like honor society or sports teams. And that about one in 10 are participating in student government or a student-based political organization. So there are lots of avenues that girls are finding in this space. If you go to the next slide, um, I want to just quickly spotlight what we what we asked about and what we found when it comes to the future facing aspects of this research. So looking into the future, we find that girls really want to take the lead in public service and in advocacy. Um, you see on the left here that 59% giving the stat there. Um, and that we, you know, when broken down, we see that this interest um, is sort of mapping out when it comes to advocating or supporting causes they care about, um, wanting a future career in public service or just leading in by participation in politics, or even wanting a career in politics. And what we see from the data is that among those who express this kind of interest in public service, advocacy, or politics, these girls are our future change makers. They're more likely to agree that in the future they'll have the power or the ability to influence or change things in their community than those who aren't interested in, in leadership in those spheres. We also see that even among those who don't necessarily see themselves in a, in a career in civics or advocacy, most of them do wanna make a positive impact on society. So 82% say they wanna make a positive impact on society through their work. And nearly everyone wants a future workplace where all employees are treated fairly, regardless of gender. And this, this also includes pay equity in the scope of, of what girls are talking about. Um, among youth who say, I want to be a future leader in advocacy, we, we hear in this research that girls are really interested or really care about um, the environment and equality and human rights issues or causes. So this includes girls and women's issues, it includes LGBTQ equity, racial equity, disability rights, and, and addressing poverty. Um, if you go to the next slide. I just wanna give a quick spotlight on where you can go to learn more about these findings. So there's a landing page for this research. If you go to girlscouts.org backslash girls leadership, it'll take you to the, the study findings and that's where we'll be posting uh, part two when we publish it this summer. And I'd also love to invite you to attend an upcoming Girl Scout Network campfire chat on March 25th. Um, and we'll put the link in the chat here as well. So if you'd like to register, this is a campfire chat looking even deeper at these, these sort of issues or questions around women's leadership. So really asking what kind of glass ceilings are still intact. Greta. And what, needs to, what needs to happen for us to smash through them. Um, the, this live virtual event, as well as the research report, is sponsored by the David and Laura Lovell Foundation. We're very grateful for their, their support with this. Um, and you can see there the, the amazing panel of speakers that we'll have at that upcoming event. And so with that, I am going to turn it back over to Angela and Catherine, who are going to introduce our next panel of speakers.
All right, thank you so much, Kimberly. Uh, we found your work extremely inspiring and super insightful because it's always extremely important to understand how we can benefit women and girls. Um, and you know, that's always through understanding what their beliefs are and how we can build upon those. Um, so we are now going to introduce our incredible panel of speakers. The first speaker is Grace. Grace is a first year ambassador with Girl Scouts of the United States of America. She interned with a political science campaign during the summer of 2020 and participated in Get Out the Absentee Vote through text banking ahead of the 2020 US presidential election. With Girl Scouts, she helped facilitate the Global Gender Equality Series, Girl Scouts of Maine's Transforming Leadership Conference, and Girl Scouts of Maine's World Thinking Day for Older Girls. Our next speaker, Kirsten, has served as a member of Girl Scouts of Orange County in California for th over 13 years and has achieved her gold award. She is an engineering student at her high school and serves as the president for her school's Health Occupation Students of America chapter and also is the president of a team she founded at her school, which provides support and safe spaces for girls to design and build electric go-karts. Kirsten's great, greatest passion is to advocate for girls and women's rights and is advocated in Washington, in Washington, DC, in Washington, DC, excuse me, meeting in the offices of senators and congressional members. Kathleen is a, young, is a youth advocate with the World Association of Girl Guides and Girl Scouts based in Batagas City, Philippines. She is one of the global advocacy champions of the World Association of Girl Guides and Girl Scouts and became a delegate to the multi-stakeholder hearing as part of the Beijing Plus 25 consultation last July, 2020, and currently one of the delegates for the 65th Commission on the Status of Women. As was one of the first batch of advocacy champions of Girl Powered Nutrition Initiative and Program in the Philippines, Kathleen hopes to contribute to the fight for of women for gender equality and help bring forth change for better education on the nutrition of young women nationally. She lobbies for better education around nutrition of younger women and has delivered a speech to decision makers in the GSP National Headquarters Manila on the pervasiveness of food advertisements and food stalls near schools. She has been one of the factors on the growing malnutrition, which, which has been one of the factors on the growing malnutrition in the Philippines. Kathleen has also acted as a speaker and facilitator for events centering around the importance of resilience and self-confidence among adolescent girls. Even founding We Are They, a youth-led photo shoot campaign to empower all genders for body confidence in work against violence and discrimination. She hopes to give back to her community and her environment through some of her, of her advocacies, like her Chief Girl Scout Medal Scheme project on livelihood and her role as a better normal youth champion with Greenspeace Philippines. Our next speaker is Emily, who is a lifelong Girl Scout and current freshman at the George Washington University studying political science. She's a bronze, silver, and gold award recipient and served as a girl advocate with the Working Group on Girls for three years. At George Washington, she's actively involved in the college Democrat community and serves in the programs department of a GW College Democrats and the College Democrats of America. Our last speaker for today is Pahla Bonke, a member of the GRAIL, a religious organization for women and girls. She originally comes from an impoverished community in South Africa. She is studying to earn a bachelor's degree in education in the foundation phase, a field chosen because she loves working with children and bringing change in people's lives. Bahula Bonke is passionate about fighting for girls' rights and access to equal education. In her work, she has served as the national chairperson of the Girl Child Movement, where she has led activities and programs that provided girls opportunities to engage with local community leaders on issues girls were facing. As a member of Equal Education, Rahla Boke has worked on challenging the South African education system to ensure equal access for all. And with that, I would love to move to the first question for all of our panelists. So of course, we gave everyone a simple introduction of what they would, um, the activities that they do, but we would love for you all to go into detail more about your past experiences with political and civic engagement. Grace, you are first to go. Uh, sure, thank you so much for that introduction. Um, like was mentioned, I interned with the Maine Democratic Party this past summer, the summer of 2020. Um, but recently, I've gotten more involved with policy making itself. Currently, I am working with my state legislators to pass a bill that will not allow city clerks um, to grant those under the age of 18 marriage licenses, effectively banning child marriage in my state. 
I decided to tackle this issue because I spent quite a lot of time this summer working with Girl Scouts of the United States to bring awareness to girls around the country about gender equality issues. I specialized in women in leadership and gender-based violence. In my research, I spent a lot of time looking at how seemingly independent gender equality issues interact with each other, specifically child marriage. When girls marry as children, they are less likely to finish high school and go to college, and they're more likely to be beaten and physically abused by their spouse, develop a variety of psychological and physical conditions and are more likely to end up in poverty. This means that the issue of child marriage doesn't stand on its own, but rather impacts girls' education, gender-based violence, and women's economic rights and justice. Admittedly, Maine's rate of child marriage is relatively low, but low is not zero, and any amount of child marriage is bad, obviously. Um, and so I'm hoping that as the movement to end child marriage picks up speed, other states will look to the legislation that we have passed and use this as kind of a role model um, to pass similar laws. Um, getting my getting this idea to become an actual bill was actually as easy um, as asking my state representative Kevin O'Connell to take it on. I emailed him one day during a study hall and went to work and promptly forgot about it. Um, and then when I got home, I saw that he'd call me and let me know that he had submitted the proposal um, to become an LR um, for the next legislative session, this one. <laughs> um, eventually the bill became an LD, a legislative document, um, which means that it is going to, on its way to the um, main House of Representatives Judiciary Committee where they will be um, basically researching and discussing it and determining if it will move on to the House um, to receive an actual vote. I will be testifying at this hearing on Thursday um, with some of the research that I've collected independently and some of the more complex concepts regarding child marriage that I've learned here at CSW. Wow, Grace, that's so exciting. I'm so proud of you for that. I think it's such a big thing. And if anything, that shows that us as individuals, we can always bring change, even um, if it's just as small as that, or even if it's something as big as ending child marriage in your state. That is wonderful. Um, Kirsten, we would like to hand the mic to you. Thank you. So I will be giving an example of both my civic and political engagement. So first, for civic engagement, in the summer of 2020, through Girl Scouts and along with other Girl Scouts, I co-created and taught a six week virtual global gender equality series to educate and empower high school girls to take action against gender-based violence and institutional gender inequalities that limit opportunities within government, private sectors and education. Throughout our discussions on leadership and education, many girls heard for the first time that it is not okay to conform to harmful gender stereotypes. Additionally, we were able to expand the perspectives of how high these girls can set their goals. During our discussions on gender-based violence, one girl told me that she's never been in a safe space before where she could tell anyone or get help for the abuse and sexual assault that she's been a victim of. Not only are we validating girls' experiences, helping them to get the help they need, we are also inspiring girls to become the leaders within their community, society, government, and beyond so that they can help put an end to the issues girls face around the world. Next, regarding my political engagement, Following my passion to fight for women and girls' rights, I have taken the opportunity to advocate for the rights of women and girls in Washington, D.C., meeting in the, officers, in the offices of senators and, con and congressional members, such as former Senator Kamala Harris and my state's congressional member, Alan Lowenthal, to discuss the importance of gender equality within the workplace, protection against abuse, such as gender discrimination and sexual assault and harassment, and the importance of funding for STEM educational programs, especially for girls and students in underserved communities. Additionally, I've also prepared a victim for court who is facing retaliation for whistleblowing gender discrimination within their workplace. Now, what led me to participate in this work has been experiences such as a conversation in middle school with a female peer who told me she simply did not believe women should be paid equally as men because it has never traditionally been that way. Additionally, I also quickly learned firsthand how real the gender disparities are, especially within STEM, as the ratio is five girls to about 30 boys in every uh, in each of my engineering classes in high school. 
And now this led me to found and lead an all-female multi-ethnic team of aspiring engineers in designing uh, and building building and racing electric vehicles, which we earned the first place award. This award was a huge accomplishment within my high school, demonstrating that girls can succeed within engineering and STEM. And more importantly, it was able to create a community of female engineers that will always be there as a support system for future girls who are aspiring engineers. I believe it is extremely important to mentor and help younger girls stand up against gender discrimination and professionally learn to navigate the world, especially in areas where it is currently male dominated. Thank you so much, Kirsten. I think it's so incredible that you found something that was, you know, you, you saw a problem, you recognized it, then you took that initiative to, of course, change um, the norms within your community and, of course, empower the girls in your own life. That is incredible. The next speaker I'd like to hand the mic to would be Kathleen. Hello, everyone. So firstly, I hope you are all safe and well in whatever part of the world you are in right now. So um, I'm Kathleen and I have been fortunate. Uh, I have been one of the fortunate girls selected to be uh, the Global Advocacy Champion of World Association of Girl Guides and Girl Scouts or WAGS. So I had the chance to represent WAGS during the multi-stakeholder hearing for the Beijing Plus 25. And right now we are representing WAGS for the 6th to 5th Commission and the Status of Women or CSW 65. So whereas in my member organization, which is the Girl Scouts of the Philippines, we had the opportunity to improve nutrition. Um, um, where we, when we worked as the pioneer batch of the Girl Powered Nutrition Program Advocacy Champion in the Philippines. So we advocated for better opportunities for girls and young women to improve their ed, uh, nutrition and get the proper education with regards to health and um, nutrition. So we lobbied to address malnutrition among adolescent girls and young women. Although the mal mal uh, malnutrition rates in the Philippines is not very high compared to other states, it remains to be very crucial and important. And it is something that we have to tackle and discuss because it also affects the education, performance, and self-esteem of young girls. So this is something that we believe that we have to combat as early as now. Uh, another experience, uh, experience that I got is I also... Um, became one of the better normal youth champions of Greenpeace Philippines, where we learned all about livable cities, uh, inspired leadership, good governance, active citizenry, and policy lobbying. So those are some of the um, topics that we uh, discussed and we um, did at at attended trainings for so that we will be better equipped as we lobby for um, better uh, environment. So during our term, being uh, the Youth Normal Advocacy Champions, we work on the Better Normal Youth Agenda, Ambag ng Kabataan, which means youth's contribution in English, where we called on to the Philippine government to take action so that we can achieve the hashtag Better Normal that we are all hoping for, especially for the youth. So going, going all over these uh, experiences again, I am reminded of the very reason that I got involved in uh, Girl Scouting and in this movement in the first place. Um, Girl Scouting sessions in my school used to be something that all girls are required to uh, partake in. And in my high school, we attend uh, Girl Scouting sessions every Friday afternoon. But um, when we would have lectures and engaging activities, but scouting and guiding, it grew on me as years passed. And it became something so much more than an extracurricular. It became something uh, more than a school requirement. And I just became so inspired with the girl leaders that we have back in my school. And I saw the dedication that women put up uh, when it comes to empowering their uh, uh, fellow girls and fellow young women. So. I told myself uh, years ago that I want to pass on everything that I learned and hopefully inspire uh, my fellow youth girls. And I want to be a reminder to my peers and fellow women that we have also what it takes to lead and that our voices matter too. So those are some of my experiences and take on this. 
All right. Thank you so much, Kathleen. I think your experience has been across all different topics. I think it's so cool how you can bring all of them into one and, you know, empower youth in so many different ways. That's definitely incredible. Um, I would like to pass the mic to Emily. Hi, everyone. Um, so I really feel as if I've been at least somewhat involved in political activism, political engagement throughout my entire life. Um, both of my older sisters were Girl Scouts, um, and so they really helped me to try to like find my political voice. Um, and then once I took a civics class in eighth grade, I really realized how much I really enjoyed politics and how much I wanted to be involved in that work. Um, so that passion ultimately allowed me, like some of the other girls in this panel, um, to become involved in different congressional campaigns um, and also to be a girl advocate with the Working Group on Girls, which is one of the reasons why I'm here today. Um, and it also uh, influenced me to complete my Girl Scout Gold Award project. Um, for those of you who don't know, the Gold Award is the highest award you can earn in Girl Scouting, um, and it involves doing an 80-hour project that serves to create lasting change within your community. So because of my passion for civic engagement, I chose to focus my project around increasing the connection between young voters and their local government, um, where decisions are being made that affects them on a daily basis. So I realized that young people really didn't care what was going on, uh, like either on the school board or their local government, and the school board and the local government really didn't care what students thought. Um, and that was either because they, you know, those young people weren't voting, um, and also because those young people weren't making their voices heard. So in order to increase that connection, I started a few programs at my school. Um, and the first was distributing voter education packages to each student as they turned 18. Um, and these packets included um, resources about how to register to vote, about what elections were coming up that were important, and also about different issues uh, that are important for students to pay attention to. It's examples of, you know, climate change, uh, education costs. So, you know, basically saying these politicians are making decisions on these things that are going to affect you every day. Do you know what those issues are? Do you know who the, those people are that are making those decisions for you. Um, and then the second aspect uh, was creating a student representative position on both my town's board of education and the town council. Um, and these positions basically allowed students who aren't able to vote or who generally like aren't able to have their voices heard have a direct seat at the table. Um, and then they're able to you know, have their voices heard about issues again that are going to affect them every day. And so by increasing the students' access to these local government bodies, um, they would in turn be more incentivized to pay attention to political issues on a local level. Um, and then again, be able to make sure that their governmental bodies and their representatives are really, you know, implementing policy and implementing change that are going to affect them in a positive way. You know, that, that's amazing. I think it's, I love the part where you said, I think that, um, you know, local politics is not really that big of a concern now, or to a lot of, uh, you know, people within my community as well. A lot of people just care about like what happens nationally. And so you, you, you lose a little bit of that focus. So I think it's wonderful that you are empowering youth within your local your local community to sort of care more about local politics and sort of create that that change and to, of course, push to have their voices being heard within, um, you know, local governments. So I think that's amazing. Our right, final speaker for this question would be Bahla Bonke. Greetings, everyone. Um, my experience with political engagement was when I was in high school and involved in a movement called local education which stands for quality education for all. What inspired me to join the equal education movement was the pain and suffering that we as learners went through in the hands of the education system and I wanted change. As part of this movement, we had, pro we had to protest to parliament and hand over a memorandum that contained all the learners' complaints and struggles. Issues included in the memorandum were removing of people like trains and installing proper toilets, Fix poor infrastructure, schools to have fences and securities at the gates, introducing feeding schemes because there are learners that go to school hungry. So feeding schemes helps them to focus at school. Transport for learners that travel kilometers to reach school for their safety. The challenges that we faced were we had to sleep outside the parliament so that political leaders can come out to hear us. Also, we wanted to hand over the memorandum to the Minister of Education but she didn't arrive. Hence, her office came out, took the memorandum, and said that they will hand it to her. Also, my school didn't support the movement. There were a lot of protests taking place, led by parents of the learners at school. It is still an ongoing process to address the issue in the memorandum, 
but the due date given to the minister was by 2030, all schools around South Africa should have been fixed and installed all the components that learners details in the memorandum. Um, how did this experience impacted my life today? It has impacted my life in a way that I've grown mentally, physically and psychologically as a leader and being a young girl. It has shown me that a leader is someone that has morals, is grounded and has respect for everyone and can lead by example. It has strengthened my leadership skills and taught me how to use my voice without offending, discriminating against or disrespecting anyone. Lastly, I'm a better version of myself. I've grown both mentally and physically. I know what a leader is, how a leader should behave. I understand now that a leader doesn't comment or call shots to the people she leads, but she becomes people and works with them in respect. Also, what has changed is that I know that for everything to work, I need to engage with my team and always ask for guidance whenever I feel lost. It has also told me that in whatever journey that I embark on in voicing my opinion, trying to help young girls out there, it is not a mistake, but it is also a success to other girls out there. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think your words about what it means to be a leader is they're super inspiring and I have to agree to that. I think that those are exactly what a leader should be and you are def you are the exact definition of what a leader is. So thank you for your work. I would like to hand it over to Catherine now to talk about why girls leadership and political engagement is super important. Awesome, thank you, Antolin. Um, So as Ms. Belmont uh, mentioned earlier, more than two thirds of girls and young women have engaged in civic or political activities in their lifetime. And obviously you all have, you know, are experts in that. That's, that's why um, we're, we're speaking to you today. Um, so our next question is, why do you think that girls' political leadership and engagement is important? Um, and we're gonna start with Kirsten. Thank you, Catherine. So especially since girls are in the population taking the brunt of the vast amount of gender inequality issues, it is so important to hear their voices and experiences in order to actually make a difference for those who are facing these issues. Girls voices need to be heard in order to ensure a greater responsiveness from governments and policymakers. We already know that many current and traditionally male dominated areas of work, especially within politics and leadership, simply are not made for women and do not support women in the same way that they support men. While it won't be easy to be a girl or woman of the transitioning generations, it is extremely important for more girls within my generation to get involved in order to not only support each other, but to bring more diverse perspectives to the table. This will benefit everyone in our community and our countries as it will allow us to thrive as girls are increasingly safe to participate in leadership and politics without harmful gender discriminations or backlash. Holding, girls, holding back girls is holding back our society as there is so much unused potential that is going to waste simply because of issues such as ingrained stereotypes that say girls are not good enough. So we definitely need to find ways to increase girls' po uh, political and leadership engagement. Thank you, Kirsten. I love your line, um, holding back girls is holding back society. That's really powerful. I think um, just ex exemplifies exactly um, how important this whole conversation is. Um, Kathleen, would you like to share next? Sure. Um, I think the involvement of girls and young women with political leadership is very crucial for many reasons. So women comprise almost half of the population, but only one fifth of government elected positions are handled, actually handled by women. And I think it is also uh, the situation in almost all uh, parts in the world. And it's not because we lack the knowledge no, uh, or the education for it, because the literacy rates are almost the same. And it's not because we can do it, because we've seen countless women all throughout history make history. So why are there still fewer women in politics in other uh, important positions? Why is it when Kamala Harris was elected as the United States first female president, uh, vice president, we reacted this, uh, the, the way we reacted. And I think it is because regardless of our ability and our knowledge when it comes to these things, despite the uh, great progression of our society, the modernization, the world still isn't ready for many women leaders. And we're about to change that. Secondly, having girls and women be involved in political leadership and engagement will advance gender equality as they gain the power to make changes with regards to ordinances and rules regulations and eventually fix the broken justice system to ensure that everyone can exercise and achieve their full rights. 
we've seen how the Prime Minister of New Zealand um, make waves as she successfully, as she and her team successfully responded to COVID-19. And this simply goes to show that women can also do well in a position that the society deemed only fit for men. And lastly, I believe it is important to have us girls and women to partake in important matters such as leadership and politics, because like what I said, our voices matter too. I think having both men and women to work together uh, will lead to nothing but prosperity and success in any goal that we are trying to accomplish. Thank you. That was an incredible answer. I love the line you said about the world is not ready for women leaders, but we're about to change that. You know, if the future of leadership and of our world is, is girls and women like you, that's a world I'm, I'm really looking forward to, to living in and seeing the future of. Um, Emily, would you like to share next? Sure. So uh, I think the reason that girls' political engagement is so important, um, especially in terms of policy and legislation, uh, kind of the first thing that you learn when you're learning about how to create good policy, and I think something that we're all learning through our experiences at CSW, um, is that you have to bring in all of the relevant stakeholders uh, in order to make sure that you're making educated decisions um, and you're making sure that your legislation is going to be you know, impactful and efficient. Um, and so girls, who are being affected by every single piece of legislation that's being produced by governments um, are not, they don't have, they're not bringing, they're not being brought to the table, right? So they're not uh, being brought to the table as stakeholders who are being impacted by that legislation. And in turn, that legislation isn't going to impact them in the way that they needed to. So if decision makers were able to bring girls to the table and say, hey, what do you need? What do you think about this piece of legislation? Girls can provide their honest and genuine feedback, um, and then that legislation can become more efficient, more well-rounded, um, so that it can have a longer, more successful impact moving forward, um, again, versus legislation that might end up not being effective because they didn't bring in all of the relevant stakeholders to make those active and beneficial decisions. Um, and so, again, it's a matter of bringing in substantive and genuine representation to make sure that all decision making is is going to have a, a lasting and powerful impact moving forward. Thank you, Emily. I really um, this your your comments really stick out to me because I'm currently studying public policy. So the idea of taking girls from being a receiver of the policy to like an active participant in the policy making process is something that I'm definitely going to try to keep in mind, both as a student and hopefully potential future policymaker myself. Um, so thank you, um, Bachelor Wanke. Would you like to go next? She's having a little bit of a, a tech issue. Um, Pahla Monka, are you there? Hey, yes, I'm here. Sorry. I had issues with my connectivity. Oh, no worries. Um, can, you, can you please repeat what um, question are we on about? Oh, she can has to repeat, repeat, the, repeat the question. The question. Yes. Um, so this question is, why do you think that girls' political leadership and engagement is important? It is important because girls bring perspective that values not only competition, but also collaboration to organizations and teams. For me and the girls in my society or community, it is very important to be exposed to the environment of, because we get to learn how to claim our platform as young girls and voicing out the issues that we encounter that would impact our lives positively positively because that environment encourages us to keep pushing for change in our community it 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 revives the hidden power in us appear in our journey of change in our community also when we engage in such platforms that's when we see that we are not alone and by having unity we can survive any storm that will come in our way when we are trying to change our our country and our community and giving us strength strength that we are creating some but coming also it is important 
change because we as young girls need to know which life changing decision are taking place so that we can voice our opinion and also it is to show the councillors out there that we as young girls voices matter and we have support structure that is our back in helping us to take the platform and talk about the pain we face. Thank you. Thank you. Your words are just so inspiring. You know, girls definitely deserve a seat and a platform at, at every table and at every decision making space. And I really just applaud applaud your work in advocating for girls um, in your town. Um, and now I'd like to pass it over to Grace to finish this question. Uh, thank you so much, Catherine. Um, I think girls' political participation is vital. Um, one, girls have different experiences in this world than boys do and than women do, um, both on an individual level and collectively. And seeking out these unique perspectives means that a given government uh, will be more able to adequately address the needs of everyone, not just a specific group with specific needs. Um, no one can speak to the needs of a group more accurately or more fully than members of the group themselves. Um, and two, gender roles definitely impact the way that people think about policy as evidenced by the male versus female um, heads of states response to the pandemic. Um, in an ideal world, there wouldn't be gender roles and we would raise children the same way with the same consideration for rights and ethics, regardless of gender. However, um, while the world still has people who raise who are raised differently with different values based on their gender. Um, we need to include those unique perspectives and priorities. And three, girls have brains and thoughts and opinions and ideas. And so while it's all well and good to talk about the reasons that women and girls are beneficial to decision-making, there's not a single reason that girls and women should be excluded intentionally or unintentionally um, from these spaces. Thus, any organization that does not seek out girls' perspectives has failed to achieve gender equality, regardless in what other ways they have succeeded. Thank you, Grace. Um, your, your comments are obviously so relevant within the girls' leadership space, and even more so when you delve into the intersections and even, even further marginalized groups. So I, I really um, thank you for your insight. Um, and now I'm going to pass it back to Ansela for our next question. Thank you so much, Catherine. All right, so we, we wanted to sort of go back on your own personal experiences. And, you know, as someone who is also very politically engaged, um, I know that there have been so many barriers to, of course, speaking out or sharing your voice or just becoming engaged in general. So our question to you was that what barriers have you faced engaging in political, what barriers have you faced in engaging in political and civic leadership? And we wanted to start off with Grace. Uh, sure. So I've definitely faced barriers that are similar to what I'm sure many girls across the world um, face every day, the being interrupted and spoken over, the having my achievements um, be credited to someone else, the ages, you can't possibly know what you're talking about, you're just a teenager, and of course, the eye roll when you call out any of these behaviors. Um, I think that the compilation of all of these experiences, especially at a young age, um, caused me to develop severe anxiety and self-doubt, um, coming to eventually like believe that almost that the things that I was doing were misrepresentations of my true self. Um, and even though my actions were authentic, I found myself like literally just a few days ago thinking, oh, maybe I shouldn't actually be going to CSW. Maybe Girl Scouts made a mistake in like choosing me. And first of all, that's garbage. Um, because like I deserve to be here and because I do cool stuff uh, for gender equality. And second of all, while I do likely have a genetic um, inclination toward anxiety, I believe that the subconscious messaging um, coming at me and girls constantly um, from so many parts of society has contributed to my feelings of inadequacy um, and believing that the things I have to say are not as important or as meaningful as the things said by other people. Uh, and those feelings definitely follow me around, but specifically when I'm engaging um, in politics and government. When I first got involved um, with my political internship this summer, I worried that I didn't know enough or wasn't doing enough to contribute. Um, and I definitely think that this is what I can now recognize as the unsubstantiated fear um, from the knowledge coming like from deep down, knowing that as a woman in a country where one success is measured by your productivity, I would have to work twice as hard um, to be recognized as an equal by my organizers. 
Um, and even though these were the exact individuals who were feminist in theory, my perception was that they didn't perceive me as equal to my male counterparts. And, you know, in retrospect, they likely did. Um, but after a lifetime of being told that I didn't measure up because of my gender and sex, this was difficult to believe. Yeah, no, I, I totally felt that on a personal level. I think it's so different when someone says that they care and that they're like, oh, we support you and whatever, but then their actions don't prove it. And so you're, you're kind of just trapped there and then you don't feel supported and then you don't feel like an equal. And I think that's such, that's definitely something that needs to change. And especially it's really apparent when we're talking about girls leadership, because like you said, women and girls are always told, oh, your opinion doesn't matter. You're only a girl. How would you know? And we really need to change that narrative in order to really empower girls to speak out. Um, the next speaker will be Bachelor Bonke. Okay, thank you. Um, the days that I faced um, were very personal because first of all, my granny did not understand the journey that I was embarking on. She didn't understand the movement that that was in. So therefore, like, she felt that I was going to fail when it comes to my studies, I was not going to focus on my studies. I was going to give all my full attention to the organization. So apparently it was hard to continue with the vision and mission of trying to help young girls out there and not have more support back at home. It becomes a difficult into going out there, speak out and being vocal. But since um, we have mentors that are well grounded, we have mentors that understand the importance of, of having a family support before you get support from outside. So they spoke with my grandmother and she finally agreed and also supported me in my journey. Um, the other barrier that I faced was with the community leaders. They felt like I was going to corrupt the young girls in my society. Um, they felt like I was going to make them become disrespectful, um, not support, not being, not being able to participate in their schoolwork. Um, also being chaotic, whereas we're only trying to get people out there to listen to what young girls were, were facing, to listen to the pain that they were going through. So again, because of the support that I had from my organization, from my mentors, from my grandmother, they did try to talk them up and understand that we're not trying to corrupt anyone, we're not trying to make any child being disrespectful or fail their studies. We're only out there to voice out the pain that they go through when they go to school, when they're in their society or when they're in their community. And lastly was with my principal, but she felt that um, at school, I was going to cause chaos and I was, I, was, I was challenging him or I was fighting his power. Whereas I was speaking out for the young girls that go through difficulties to even the school, they go through pain and, and, and it's not easy for them to even go to school at some point, others drop out to school because of the challenges that they face. So I was only there trying to to put an end to young girls dropping out of school because not having someone to speak out for, not having someone to stand up for. So eventually, because I'm very forward and I'm very vocal, I managed to talk with my principal into understanding what positive results can this movement bring if ever he agrees to have the organization within the school. And then eventually it did take place. So when I left high school in 2018, the organization was, was was taking place and it was doing tremendous changes. So I was very much grateful. Thank you so much for sharing your personal experiences with us. I could definitely relate to that as you know, as I became more outspoken and wanted to create change in my own community, um, I felt a lack of support coming from my own parents. And of course, that's because my parents are very, they're always, they're very traditional. They're, you know, parents emigrated here from Vietnam. And so they're not used to um, the whole concept of, oh, women should be equal, or, you know, they saw that as something that was too disruptive to, um, you know, my culture or whatever was you know, around me. And so because of that, I totally relate with that, um, your sentiment about that. And I really hope that we can continue to um, support girls. So, you know, we have these outside organizations that can really step in and empower girls um, so that they can have places of support. And of course we have one another. Um, so, you know, that would be wonderful if we can all just support one another and make sure that we don't leave anybody behind. Um, I would love to have Kathleen speak about her experiences next. Thank you, Antaline. So, um, 
one of the events that I had a chance to take part and help organize was for the launch of the Girl Powered Nutrition Program in Manila, Philippines. And in this event, being the advocacy champions, me and my fellow Girl Scouts had the task to invite and eventually influence decision makers coming from all over the country. So we reached out to mayors, legislators, uh, governors, health workers, and members of the education sector to help us make our goals of spreading knowledge on nutrition and uh, the importance of health for young children to be a reality. And one of the challenges I think that we had to face um, very early on in the event is that um, it's with communicating with the decision makers because um, the first step to actually do something, I believe, is to communicate with these pe- with these sets of people in power to actually help us and take part in the event. So influencing the actions of these people is another uh, is one thing, but communicating with them and actually having a response from them is another. So reaching out to people, uh, uh, to politicians can be quite hard, but we have to exert all efforts and follow up as much as we can to advance our goals because. Uh, these sets of people that we are tapping actually have the power to advance our goals and eventually back our prog- uh, programs up with the law. So organizing events, uh, planning programs, those are great and uh, important actions. But we also have to acknowledge that in some of the actions and the change that we hope to uh, see in this world, we, we really need the help of people in politics and in different uh, governments and organizations in order for us for our suggestions to be reflected in actual laws to advance our vision yeah that, that is super important and of course there's always power in numbers and of course you have to keep pushing and advocating for change and eventually hopefully you know the government officials or policymakers will eventually listen and sort of give in and uh, you know make sure that your voice is heard within the government um, and we, I would like to move on to uh, Emily. So I just want to say that I really empathize with a lot of the experiences that have been discussed um, so far in this question. Um, and I would say that one of the main experiences that I had that was a really significant barrier um, is existing leadership that is resistant to change and is uh, resistant to having young people be part of any kind of decision-making spaces. So. When I was working on my Gold Word project, uh, I had to go through you know, several rounds of different barriers, different people who I needed to get approval from before I could get to this final level. Um, and uh, as I was working through this process, I had amazing support from tons of different community leaders and uh, you know, different levels of, of, of local, local government. When I got to this final place, however, this particular male leader in my school uh, just was not interested in helping me, was not interested in communicating with me. Um, and clearly, you know, based on the experiences that I had seen between him and male students, it was clearly clear that he didn't respect me because I was a student and because I was a woman, um, which is an interesting trait for a school leader to not respect students, but, you know, we won't really get into that. Um, but he really was not transparent. He was uncommunicative. Um, and it led me to get completely off of my intended timeline with my project. So when he is the last barrier and I need to get this done and he takes a month to respond to my email, they, I, you know, there's not much you can do with that. Um, and so, and again, it was clear that he did not respect me because I was a young woman. Um, and he thought that he could push me around. He thought he could belittle me because of my age and my gender. Um, and you know, it had to, it caused me to fall behind my intended timeline and forced me to really alter my plan of action. This was, you know, it, it taught me valuable skills about learn, you know, you know, uh, learning on my feet and, try, you know, trying to communicate with unresponsive individuals and really trying to adapt my, my action plan. Um, but at the same time, it really caused me to lose, again, like a lot of my self-confidence in my ability to be a leader and my ability to empower other leaders. Um, and I, you know, I, I had all of this incredible support from women and girls around me. But once I hit this final barrier of this one male leader, it, it was like I, I deflated, right? Like all of this passion and all of this enthusiasm I had for this project almost completely went out of me um, because of how resistant this one particular person was. Um, and luckily, again, it did teach me a lot of really good skills about resilience. Um, and it also taught me 
about how important it is to have a support network um, and have people around you who can remind you that your imposter syndrome is, as Grace said, garbage. Um, and, you know, there's even without the support of one individual, you just have to continue pushing through. Um, and without that support network and without that resilience, I don't think that I would have had the momentum to finish my project. Yeah, you know, I'm, first of all, I'd want to say that, you know, I'm so glad you persevered through that. It's incredible to see how, you know, sometimes there's always barriers and it's really irritating and it's frustrating, but we're able to overcome that and then learn powerful lessons from that. So I applaud you for that. Uh, I would finally, we'd, I'd like to move to the last speaker today for this question, and that would be Kirsten. Thank you, Antolin. So similar to Emily's and the others' experiences, I've also experienced gender-based microaggressions and not being given the same respect from male peers or men in leadership positions. And especially learning from a young age within STEM, boys always made up the majority of the population within robotics or other engineering teams and organizations. And thankfully, as a child, I, I was always supported by my parents um, that, and I was told that I was an equal, and I never really saw myself as any different than my male peers. Um, but it was definitely a deterrent for other girls who saw that, you know, they didn't really want to be the only girl in these rooms. And it maybe it was also a combination within, uh, with gender stereotypes that was a deterrent for them to enter uh, into the STEM environments because it was so different from what they were used to. Um, and in STEM at such a young age, it was usually me and other girls who were waiting for uh, turns that were never going to come in a room full of boys who were usually the ones hogging up the equipment and STEM activities. So I think, you know, education of uh, clearly there wasn't enough support for the girls in the room who were trying to, you know, fulfill their STEM aspirations. And these experiences are obviously not coincidences as we have all experienced the same things. Um, and while these are frustrating experiences, we've all clearly, uh, we've all learned to grow from them and learned how to deal with them. And I think it's really important for us to pass that knowledge on to the future generations who will most likely experience these same things. And I do not want this to be a deterrent for other girls, uh, to, especially who, girls who want to enter STEM or other male dominated areas, because I know we have the strength to persevere. And I've also made amazing and supportive uh, friends, both boys and girls through my STEM education and experiences. Yeah, no, that is definitely an issue. As someone who's, uh, as one of the few youth advisors for my, uh, U the US Congresswoman for my district, Katie Porter, I totally understand how uh, irritating it can be when um, all the boys dominate the conversation and then they don't give you room to speak or there's like, you know, there's this kind of not the same understanding where you think you're equal to them, but they don't think that they're, you know, you're lesser. And so that can be extremely frustrating sometimes. So. But, you know, just like I told Emily, I'm so grateful that, you know, you persevered through that. And I think it's amazing. So I'm, you know, that's super cool. I'd love to pass the mic to Catherine and to you know, move on to the next segment. Awesome. So for our next question, um, we're going to talk about organizations. So you guys have already um, described and mentioned many of the programs you've implemented or been involved in. And I know for myself personally, I would not be where I am today without Girl Scouts. So I would like to ask if you all could briefly respond so we can um, have enough time for the Q&A and really um, discuss there with our audience. Um, so just briefly respond um, to what role your organization has played in supporting you in your leadership roles and how those experiences have impacted your life. And we'll start with Kathleen. Thank you, Catherine. So um, my experiences in Girl Scouting in the Philippines and now with the World, World Association of Girl Guides and Girl Scouts allowed me to be more immersed in different programs catering to gender equality and women empowerment. So the events, seminars, trainings, and organizing opportunities that they have granted me and my fellow Girl Scouts enabled us to attain the knowledge and equip ourselves, the skills in planning and organizing events, um, developing key messages, crafting publication materials that all are necessary in um, promoting and uh, publicizing our goals. So. I think these uh, skills allowed us to reach wider audience in different platforms too, uh, and allowed us to gain our own voices. And uh, uh, one of the uh, things that I'm really grateful for in this movement is that it allowed me to be uh, confident in myself, to uh, it increased my self-esteem and my belief in myself. So everything that I have now, uh, all that I know, I owe it to these experiences. And I am very grateful uh, with my uh, member organizations and WAGs. 
because uh, all throughout these years, they sh they helped shape me. And um, with the opportunities that I gain in this organizations, <laughs> a bit cliche and a bit uh, touchy, but uh, I got to know myself better. And uh, uh, these experiences taught me that being a woman is really amazing and that we should, and that we hold now the power to actually help our fellow girls and young women to also realize what we have realized in this movement. I often say this because uh, it is very true, but Girl Scouting and Girl Guiding uh, really changed my life for the better. Thank you. I agree with everything you just mentioned. Um, I think I grew in a lot, my self-confidence a lot from, from being a, a Girl Scout growing up. Um, Grace, would you like to go next? Absolutely. So first of all, I wouldn't be here without Girl Scouts. I was selected as a delegate to UCSW 64 um, by Girl Scouts of Maine. Unfortunately, even though it was canceled, um, I was able to take all of the knowledge and skills I gained in preparation for that conference um, and be able to use that to facilitate um, gender equality and leadership events um, and educate girls all over the country um, during the past year about those subjects. Um, going back further, Girl Scouts was really the first place that I learned to innovate and create my own things and improve on things that already existed. Um, Girl Scouts was the first time I could express my ideas with my peers beyond the school setting. Um, and basically, just quickly, it boils down to this. Girl Scouts made me who I am today, and without Girl Scouts, um, I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't know how to think critically about the events happening around me, um, and I definitely wouldn't be as politically engaged as I am currently. Thank you, Grace. I'm going to pass it over to Bash Um, Thank you. The girl played a very important role in adding to the teachings that I have. They've, ta they've taught me the importance of teamwork, patience and respect for others. And they've made me understand the values of being a leader, speaking for the voiceless and the impact, the impact that I make when I start talking. Also I've been Zoom meeting activities and platform to express myself without feeling that I'm founded. They made me understand the meaning of change, why change is important and how to walk the talk by being the change you want to see. I did training in the grail, which was very educational because I was given knowledge. There were activities that wanted us to learn more about other countries and the challenges they go through. Another one was when we had to choose our role models in leadership. They say, they said, why do we choose them? And what qualities do we see in them that define us into saying they are our role models? So that made me do self-introspection to find those qualities within me my community and the girls that I work with. And lastly, a house with a solid foundation never collides. It stands for, for a very long time. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was really, really impactful. Uh, Kirsten, would you like to share next? Yes, so my previous experiences, first of all, of facing gender discrimination and seeing firsthand how gender roles affect girls my age, whether it is girls not being given the same opportunities as male peers within STEM or not believing they are worthy of equal pay, this has inspired me to, to continue my advocacy work and keep reaching higher goals despite any gender stereotypes or traditional gender role backlash I may face because this is bigger than me. And I know it is of the utmost importance for girls who have been empowered and taught about gender equality to continue to empower others and make strides for the population of girls and women as a whole. And regarding my experiences of leadership, uh, it's def they've definitely impacted my life as well, as I've advocated for legislation and lobbied in Washington, D.C. for the protection of women and girls that will even help protect myself as I prepare to enter the currently male-dominated engineering workforce. Um, I've been so successful within my leadership in political and civic engagement because of organizations such as Girl Scouts that have empowered me with the knowledge that as a girl, I am a valued member of society and deserve the same human rights and equal treatment as men in all aspects of my life. For 13, girl, for 13 years, Girl Scouts has given me a safe space for personal growth, growth and intellectual development and has empowered me to create positive changes throughout my local community and the world. And most importantly, it has provided me the resources I need when opportunities uh, presented for civic and political leadership engagement. Along with what the others stated about the importance of Girl Scouts reaching us at such a young age, 
Girl Scouts has also shown me the impacts of using the power I have as one individual when I partner with or other organizations that are already working on issues I am passionate about. And I've been able to succeed working with these organizations since Girl Scouts has allowed me to work on projects like this from a very young age. Girl Scouts has also emphasized to us girls that we are global citizens to think beyond the issues of our immediate communities, state, and even country. If the pandemic has shown us anything, it has shown us how truly connected we all are, uh, even to countries on the other side of the world. And I think it is so important for organizations to recognize the benefit of bringing groups uh, of bringing groups of such diverse people together. Thank you, Kirsten. Um, they should use that for an advertisement. That was, you know, inspiring to me. And obviously, I've been involved in Girl Scouts my whole life. Um, Emily, would you like to share next? Yes. Um, so, like everyone has said, I literally would not be here without Girl Scouts. Um, I've said this a million times, but uh, every amazing thing that's happened in my life at some point or another happened because of Girl Scouts. Um, and I think the amazing thing about Girl Scouts is that it provides you a safe space to, you know, foster your skills, right? You can learn how to be a leader. Uh, you can learn how to lead a team. Uh, in a safe space where you feel like you're not going to be judged for being too bossy, you're not going to be judged for being pushy. If you make a mistake, the people around you are going to support you and you can get back up and keep moving along. And then once you go out back out into like, you know, the quote unquote real world, uh, you have so much more confidence in your ability to lead uh, that even when you're, you might be pushed around or you might be belittled, you know that you have those skills. And like I said earlier, you have that support network of girls around you um, that can remind you just how amazing you are. Um, and something that's, you know, obviously my past experiences, again, are the reason that I'm here, the reason that I'm, again, like I'm pursuing a career in politics and in policy long-term. Um, and, you know, moving to college and moving into those new, like real world spaces, um, you know, in political organizations, there's a lot of people, especially men, uh, who feel it's their, you know, their duty to gatekeep politics. And if you can't name every single uh, con con congressional candidate from, you know, the 19, whatever, 1992 Senate or congressional races, uh, you don't have a role in these organizations. Um, and that's a very stressful thing to get involved in. But I think because of my past experiences and because of the confidence I was able to build through Girl Scouts, uh, through the working group on girls, uh, I was able to say, hey, I know that I am good enough. I know that I have the skills and the knowledge to be effective in different positions within these organizations and actually you know, contribute and make change within these political organizations, which I've been able to do over the last year. Thank you, Emily. I love, thank you for bringing up like gatekeeping. I think that's something so important to talk about within like the field of studying policy and politics. That's really, really important. Um, so that wraps up our panel section of the event. And now we're gonna move into our Q and A. So if any of you guys um, have any questions for our, um, any of our panelists, you can leave those in the chat. We've seen a few come in. So now I'm gonna pass it over to England to ask our first question. Yeah, so uh, like Catherine said, if you have any questions or you'd like to participate, we always have the chat. Um, the two of us will be moderating it there and we will be reading out the questions. So the first question that was asked was a while ago and we were looking at it was from Abida Jamal. And for the panelists, the question was, what inspired you to continue to be involved in political participation, even with all the challenges you face? And any of you are open to unmute and answer that question. All right, uh, well, I'll, oh, sorry, Kathleen, go ahead. It's okay. <laughs> okay, uh, so um, what inspired me to continue uh, despite all the barriers that all of us experience when it comes to lobbying and advocating for our causes is that because these barriers are uh, the evidences that there is a need for us to continue because if these um, uh, gender inequality, if this, if we still have men who belittle what we can do, what women and girls can do, then there is definitely definitely a need for us to even pursue this more because that only goes to show that we have we still have a lot to work on with and uh, and that I think it's really important to have us working on these uh, impacts because like uh, what we mentioned in the questions before, um, we are the ones who are directly affected. So I think uh, it is also up to us to take charge and uh, do actions. Thank you. Uh, 
Emily, would you like to go or? Yeah, I, I mean, I would just like to add on that. Um, I think just like Kathleen said, when you see that things are bad or that you know things aren't going very well, it kind of motivates you even more to keep getting involved and keep working. Um, and I think kind of like right off of that, um, being able to help other girls learn how to be leaders and hopefully like kind of lead with your example um, is something that's been really powerful for me, kind of moving in and, and kind of learning how to be a mentor to other girls. Um, that's been something that's super inspiring to me. Um, and I really, really love to do it. And so I think like, even when things get frustrating, if you show your resilience, if you show your passion, you can motivate others to be just as resilient and just as, uh, as passionate. Um, and then that's continuing just to create that like substantive change moving forward. Yeah, just really quick along with uh, what Emily just said, I think the most important thing that has inspired us and me personally has been uh, seeing other role models within our lives and I think it is so important for girls to have other role models like for example uh, who have you know gone through difficult experiences and who have shown uh, true perseverance so for me my role models are my paternal grandfather um, who you know, at the age of eight was interned in the Japanese American internment camps, which obviously was a horrible experience, but, you know, he grew up to become an electrical engineer and served as first lieutenant in the United States Army. So I think experiences like that, um, who, uh, where you've really seen such resilience and perseverance and, you know, you, people are able to come out of it uh, as a stronger person. I think it is so important for other girls to listen to other girls' experience within, you know, these male dominated areas or just other people they can look up to as role models. Yeah, I think all of your answers are extremely true. Um, I think the community is also really, you know, another really motivating factor. It's like, it's not about you, it's about all the people within uh, your local area that need it most. Of course, that's based on um, what Kathleen and Emily mentioned as well. It's just, it's not even like, you know, it just the thought of making change within your own community will always overpower the thought of, you know, sometimes being beaten down. And so you overcome those obstacles and you, you know, help fight for change. Um, Catherine, would you like to ask the next question? Yes. Um, so this is from Wendy Drummond. So she says that several of you as the panelists mentioned how important confidence is to your success. Um, so what is one way that you think um, maybe is the best way to build confidence in young girls? Um, so um, I, oh, sorry, Preston, okay, you can go. Um, the best way I think to help girls is to firstly understand the power that their voices have is to also understand their importance within the society. They should not look down on themselves, they should not undermine themselves, and they should understand gender violence, gender based violence or not, or gender inequality. They are important, they are the future for the next generation. And also to have like um to have programs that are there to motivate them, to train them to speak to make them understand what challenges they would encounter and how to tackle those challenges that would encounter. I think that would be the best way to boost and help their confidence out there. Thank you. Yeah, definitely, I agree. Um, I work with kids, um, like school age kids after school. Um, and so one of the things that I've noticed just as far as building confidence is in general um, is yes and or yes but statements. Um, so like, yes, we can do that, but we clean up afterwards. So like, and that's a very basic example, but um, showing that you're, you're hearing young girls and that you're appreciating what they have to say and what they have to contribute even when like you don't want to play go fish for the 10,000th time is showing them that what they have to say is important and then I think because like go fish isn't policy making um but the the core the courage to ask um comes from a very similar place I think and then building um I think confidence in leadership specifically is making sure that you're seeking out girls' perspectives, that you're actively looking um, to, to hear from younger girls so that you're showing them that they don't have to do everything to make their voices heard because, because their voices are important, you're looking for them. Yeah, I just want to add really quick, I think just to reemphasize the importance of safe spaces. Um, 
teach girls to be leaders, teach girls confidence, like outside of um, like, you know, co-ed communities, like let them foster their skills, let them learn about themselves in a place where they're not feeling pressured all the time, or they're not feeling stress all the time. Um, and then, you know, once they can feel comfortable in those spaces, they can go out into the world and be a lot more confident in themselves. And I also want to say, Grace, sometimes it feels like go fish is policymaking. America recently, policymaking is very interesting, but anyway, just want to throw that out there. Really quick to emphasize what Grace said. Um, I think it is definitely so important to educate girls at a young age. And educate girls doesn't mean telling them, oh, you know, like when you grow older, you're going to have less of a chance uh, being in a leadership position. No, what we mean by education is that you tell girls, like, uh, kind of switch things from maybe negative lights to positive lights, such as, oh, no, you're not nervous to uh, go up and speak. You're just really excited for this next event. Or, no, you are not uh, scared or have these fears. You just have not been exposed to them yet. And, you know, you should try more of these experiences. So I think really being able to support girls and give them the confidence that they need uh, so that they don't doubt themselves from an early age is so important. And, th you know, thankfully, for those of us who have um, that support within our home that, uh, you know, is able to build us up. And for those of us who don't, we need to make sure that our teachers and people in our community leaders are reaching out to these girls to make sure they have that support from somewhere. Also, um, just to add, so I believe that many girls and girls and women have the capacity to be more involved, especially in leadership roles. However, they don't always get the proper resources to actually do it. So, um, and they all they don't, they don't always get that encouragement to build their confidence. So, I think one of the best ways that we can do to help girls and young women to build their confidence is through uh, giving them trainings and giving them more opportunities because and. I think we also have to recognize that there is a need to prioritize uh, increasing the funding and to the need for more structured programs designed to help these girls because uh, we must foster positivity and uh, we must give them opportunities to ignite the spark of inspiration for girls and young women because um, I believe that the moment that we get girls to be inspired and confident and um, uh, empowered, that's when we know that we will have uh, an amazing set of uh, uh, women leaders for our future. Thank you. Um, I, we can obviously keep going with these questions for, for hours probably, but um, most of you probably you know, don't want to sit here for that, for that long. Um, so we're going to wrap up with um, one final question. So we're going to do this like rapid fire style. So if you guys, I know you could talk about your, your policy goals and the vision for your future for, for hours. And we would all love to hear all of your, your thoughts, but um, if you could just keep it brief. So um, the question now is what is one thing that you think that policymakers should implement to support girls in leadership roles? So we can start with Emily. This is going back on like, just talking about everything that we've already talked about, but um, mentorship show girls where role models are, connect them, create this cycle of mentorship and support that is going to continue to empower girls and young women in politics. Thank you. Um, um, what I would like to say would be, um, allow girls to speak out, allow girls to make mistake and understand that they can make mistake and they can also learn from their mistakes do not cage them. Do not feel. Do not make them feel like like they, they are forced to say certain things. Allow them to indicate the suffering and the pain that they go through, and how do they want to fix certain challenges as young girls. Also, to take them out of their comfort zone, because if ever you're in a comfort comfort zone, chances of growing up are so are so little. And also, the data is in their hands, so they have to take it and make the change for the girls out there. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Kirsten. Thank you, Catherine. So just to quickly reiterate, you know, what we've already said. So first of all, we talked about how there needs to be more outreach to girls beginning at a young age, you know, where they spend their time, schools, park, community centers, churches. Um, we also talked about how, you know, teachers and community leaders should have more training in order to understand and know how to encourage and support diversity and see past these existing biases in order to be more inclusive of, inclusive of, inclusive of girls. 
And um, I think even more importantly, governments and their policymakers need to partner with big data organizations or researchers that are using state of the art programs to collect more accurate statistics on girls' successes and challenges in regards to gaining equal opportunity and having access and representation in all areas, including education, government, corporations, employment, housing, and economic growth opportunities. And without the collection of data on these issues, there won't be a proper there won't be any proper reports to show where and how gender inequalities affect girls in different communities. And I want to conclude my part by stating it is vital for agencies, both government and NGOs, to provide a safe space for girls to grow and develop within both the civic and political sectors. To harness a girl's power of one, to take action is so necessary to ensure their equality in all aspects of their lives for themselves and other girls globally. Uh, Kathleen? Uh, my take in that is that since we're talking about more involvement for girls and women and leadership roles, so I am urging policymakers and organizations to uh, take action in discussing the uh, harmful stereotypes and discriminatory social norms with, which discourage the aspiration and dreams of uh, girls and young women, especially in uh, fields which are currently dominated uh, by men. So policy, uh, policymakers should spearhead in, in encouraging girls and young women to hold roles and positions in different sectors. I also believe that uh, uh, comprehensive reforms may be done to restructure the current laws and regulations so that we can actually st uh, fight uh, the discrimination against women in um, uh, government uh, and political positions. Thank you, uh, Grace. To wrap up? Sure, just super quickly, I'd like to see more legislators and policymakers reaching out to marginalized groups um, for their input on policy that will affect them. Awesome. And now I'm going to pass it back to Antolin for a final uh, closing remarks. Yeah, thank you so much, Catherine. So we only have a few minutes left, so we're about to, you know, we're going to close the meeting. Um, and to our incredible panel, we want to thank you so much for speaking and for sharing us all your inspirational messages and personal stories. Um, you are all super young, but so incredibly insightful, and you've already taken so many powerful, inspiring steps to really advance gender equality within uh, your local areas, so that'd be in schools, your town, states, even your country. Um, we really want to wish you the best in all your future endeavors and projects. And both mm -hmm. Catherine and I have an immense amount of confidence um, that our future, if in the hands of powerful girl leaders like yourselves, um, will inch closer to achieving real gender equality. And so to our audience, we want to thank everyone so, so much for your engagement um, in our session today. And we um, want to thank you for all the incredible questions that you've asked to our panel. I hope that everyone has a fantastic rest of their day and the a great remain, rem, remainder of um, CSW 65. Um, I will pass it back to Audra to see if she has any closing remarks or comments. Thanks, Antolin. I just wanna say thank you all to our amazing panelists and our wonderful moderators. We are definitely in good hands with all of you. And I think you guys continue to prove why girls' political leadership in, in participation is important and um, a right and something that we all need to continue to support and push forward. So thank you and everyone have a great day.